Welcome to Da Vinci Academy's Chapter 4 Unit of the Abdomen, our Lecture 1, which will be on the vasculature of the abdomen. So the vasculature of the abdomen is focused around the paired and unpaired branches off the aorta. However, there's three primary structures in the abdominal cavity to note. The aorta, a little portion of the IVC, the inferior vena cava, as well as the portal venous system. The aorta, which is the primary arterial supply to the abdominal, pelvic, and lower extremities, is a retroperitoneal structure that is located left of the midline vertebral bodies. The venous system is very unique, however, because it, it drains directly into the liver for detoxification and nutrient processing rather into the inferior vena cava and heart. So the aorta is the largest blood vessel in the human body. It is composed of four structures, the ascending aorta, the arch of the aorta, the descending aorta, and the abdominal aorta. These first three structures are all located inside of the thoracic cavity. It's this abdominal aorta that is located in the abdominal cavity as it passes through the diaphragm at the level of the T12 vertebrae. It then terminates at right around L4 and splits into the common iliac arteries. Again, the way to remember that is by forcation four, so L4. So the aorta has five paired branches and four unpaired branches. The branches from superior to inferior off of the abdominal aorta, inferior phrenic arteries, which supply blood to the diaphragm. You have the celiac trunk, which provides blood to all of the foregut, the superior mesenteric artery, which provides it to the midgut, the middle suprarenal arteries, which is one of the three arteries that provide blood to the adrenal glands, the renal arteries, which provide blood to the kidneys, conatals, which provide blood, descend very long distance, all the way to the testicles and ovaries. And then you also have the IMA, which provides blood to the hindgut, the medial sacral artery, which provides blood to the pelvic region, as well as the sacrum the bone itself, and then the lumbar arteries, which provide blood to the abdominal anterior wall musculature. So first we're going to discuss the branched arteries. So the branched arteries, first one like I mentioned before, is composed of inferior phrenic, which provides blood to the inferior diaphragm, the middle suprarenal to the adrenals, the renal arteries to the kidneys, gonadals all the way descend into the testes and ovaries because the testes and ovaries actually embryologically originate in the abdominal cavity and descend down. And then finally the lumbar arteries, which provide blood to the anterior abdominal wall and the spinal cord. The unpaired arteries are probably the more important version, and these are composed of the celiac trunk, which is this large branch vessel that branches off first and provides blood to the foregut, so which is the liver, spleen, stomach, duodenum, pancreas, and lower esophagus. The SMA is another very large structure that provides blood to, again, a portion of the lower duodenum and pancreas, but all the blood to the jejunum, all the blood to the ileum, and all the blood to the ascending colon, cecum, appendix region, and then part of the blood to the proximal transverse colon. The IMA, which is right here, provides blood again to portion of the colon, distal transverse, and more important, anastomosis, all the descending colon, the sigmoid, and portion of the upper rectum, where the other portion of the middle and lower rectum is provided by the blood that enters via the common iliac arteries. Then finally, the median sacral artery, which branches right here, is hard to see, tucked away, but it's right off the middle of the abdominal aorta, almost at the bifurcation and it rises posteriorly and provides blood to the lumbar sacral and importantly the coccyx vertebrae itself. So now we're gonna go discuss the celiac trunk. So overall, the celiac trunk is considered to be the second branch and the first unpaired vessel off of the aorta and it branches off the level of the T12 almost right immediately as the abdominal aorta passes through the diaphragm. The celiac trunk is very important for all the upper abdominal organs in the foregut. It splits immediately into three branches. It splits off into the left gastric, like right here. Then it splits off into the splenic, which also goes towards the left upper quadrant. And then off to the right is the common hepatic artery. So the celiac trunk, like as we mentioned, left gastric, which provides blood to the lower esophagus and lesser curvature of the stomach, has an important anastomosis with the right gastric. And that anastomosis of the right gastric comes off of the proper hepatic artery. The splenic artery, which provides a predominant blood supply to the spleen as well as to the pancreas. It's a very torturous blood vessel that rides and is located posterior to the stomach. It has important branches that include the left gastroepiploic, as you can imagine, provides blood to the stomach as well as to the surrounding omentum. It also has a short gastric artery, which can also perforate and, ent and enter into the regions of the stomach itself on the backside. And also the pancreatic branches that provide blood to the pancreas. 
on the right side of the celiac trunk is the common hepatic artery, which is a very important branch that provides all of the blood to the liver, the gallbladder, and a portion of the duodenum. It provides blood via the gastroduodenal arteries to the stomach duodenum and pancreas, and then also further would bifurcate and split into what's called the gastropiploic and the superior pancreaticoduodenal artery. So the gastropiploic, as mentioned before, has a right and left, provides the greater curvature. So if you have the stomach like this, it's a crude stomach, this is the greater curvature, this is the left curvature, lesser curvature, the left and right provided to the lesser curvature, and the gastropiploic, left and right gastropiploic, will provide blood to the greater curvature. So the superior mesenteric artery, this is the second unpaired branch off of the aorta and arises at the usually around the level of L1. It provides blood to the midgut, the inferior portion of the pancreas, the distal duodenum, the small bowels, including the adrenum and ileum, the ascending colon, and the region of the hepatic flexure of the transverse colon. The stomach, the splenic vein, and the neck of the pancreas run anterior to the SMA, while the left renal veins, the inferior duodenum, and the unsinate process of the pancreas run posteriorly. The SMA is a very important vessel because this is sometimes actually occluded. Just as the coronaries and the heart are occluded, the SMA can become occluded and cause pretty much angina for the intestines. So the superior mesenteric has numerous branches as well and contains the inferior pancreaticoduodenal artery which forms an anastomosis with the superior pancreaticoduodenal artery off of the celiac trunk. It also has the middle colic artery which provides blood to that hepatic flexure of the transverse colon and forms that really important anastomosis that's called the artery of Drummond that's almost always tested on examinations because it provides what is that crucial blood supply to this region, the transverse colon. You also have the right colic artery which supplies blood to the ascending colon as well as region of the cecum is provided by the ileocolic artery, which is considered to be the last branch of the SMA. Interestingly enough, the appendix actually has a little branch that's often tested at the appendicular artery, which is a branch off the ileocolic and provides blood to the appendix right here and is important when appendectomies are performed is to find this, isolate this, and sometimes even ligate this vessel. And as you can see in a very blown up image, if this would be the terminal part of the ileocolic vessel, this would then provide blood posterior to this portion of the ileum, it's hard to see, but if you can carry this through, it carries down into here, and this right here becomes the appendicular artery. What's difficult to understand about these is that there isn't necessarily one jejunal artery or one ileal artery. It's a branch of multiple different arteries that form a nice, complex, integrated arterial system. What is often very tested and very important to know is the difference between the jejunal and ileal arteries architecture. So in determining them, it's important to note that the jejunal arteries have fewer arcades and then longer vasa recta. So this is an arcade, kind of like imagine like an arch, arch of like a, a church or some type of building. It has fewer arcades, but it has very long vasa recta. But then when you look at the iliac arteries, which is the second one right before you get to the cecum, it has more arcades. So another arcade here, one arcade here, another arcade, 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 arcade numerous arcades, and very tiny, very quick, very quick, quick, quick vasa recta. So now we're going to discuss the inferior mesenteric artery. So the inferior mesenteric artery is considered the third unpaired artery off of the aorta and branches in the region roughly around L3. It provides majority, of, if not all, the blood to the hindgut, the splenic flexure of the transverse colon, descending colon, and the sigmoid branches. The inferior mesenteric artery has three primary branches, the left colic, the sigmoid artery, and the superior rectal artery. So the left colic artery branches into the ascending and descending divisions. The ascending, of course, reaches up and goes up into the splenic flexure, right here being the ascending portion, and the descending portion provides it to the lower portion of the descending colon and almost into the sigmoid itself. It provides blood to the distal one-third of the transverse colon, descending colon. It does contribute to the marginal artery of Drummond anastomosis, as well as forms a tiny anastomosis with the sigmoid artery. And the sigmoid artery provides direct blood to the descending colon, sigmoid colon, and runs anterior to the psoas major, left internal spermatic vessels, and the ureter, and can sometimes be injured during open surgeries for ureteric procedures. The last segment off the inferior mesenteric artery is the superior rectal artery, which is a descending branch that provides blood to the upper rectum. It forms an important portal cable anastomosis with the middle and inferior rectal arteries, which come off of the internal iliac, a branch of the common iliac. Now we're going to go ahead and discuss the venous system of the abdominal cavity. So when discussing the venous system, it's important to know both prim primary structures, the IVC and the portal venous system. 
So the IVC is a retroperitoneal structure that is present in the abdominal cavity, yet is not really a direct recipient of any of the abdominal organs. It primarily receives blood from the common iliac vessels, including branches from the external and iliac, that receive blood from the organs of the pelvic cavity as well as the lower extremities. The IVC bifurcates at the L5 region, and the way I remember that is I always remember bifurcation with the aorta, so if the inferior vein cava is lesser than or inferior, it's going to be L5 rather than L4. The IVC will then ascend through the abdominal cavity retroperitoneal and actually unite with the hepatic veins right before they enter into the thoracic cavity. On the other side is the portal venous system, which doesn't have any association with the pelvic organs, no association really with the lower extremities, and receives all the direct drainage from bloods of the intestines. As you eat and consume food, you also consume toxins and fat, waste, and other materials. So your body has to somehow control this, and in doing so, it will actually take this, this nutrient, toxin, fat, filled blood to the livers, where the liver will then use its cytochrome P450 systems and other associated enzymes to process all of this. Then the blood is then drained into the hepatic veins, where it then enters back up into the IVC. So the poor venous system actually receives blood from the abdominal intestines, from the lower esophagus, all the way to the anal canal, the spleen, stomach, pancreas, gallbladder, as other associated accessory abdominal organs. So in discussing the portal system and discussing the IVC system, it's important to understand that there is this communication between the two. It's called a portal cable anastomosis. And this is where the systemic system, pretty much anything that's associated with the IVC, and the portal system will actually communicate with one another. And in certain instances where it's pathologic, blood can actually be rerouted in a retrograde manner and cause very specific hallmark presentations. For example, at the lower esophagus where you get blood from the superior middle portion, from the systemic system, and then you get blood draining at the lower esophagus from the venous system, will be one side of portal cable anastomosis. So the overlying skin of the abdominal cavity is actually composed of uh, communication between the system, and it's right around here where you can get portal cable anastomosis dilation called umbilical varices or caput medusa. Varices meaning dilation, venous dilation. Then also, as we discussed before, with the rectum having shared blood supply and blood drainage from the portal system and the systemic system, you can get precipitation of internal hemorrhoids as well. So when discussing the gonadal arteries, it's important to discuss the gonadal veins. So as you know, as you remember from earlier in this lecture, the gonadal arteries arise from the abdominal aorta. However, the gonadal vessels do not actually communicate at all with the portal venous system. They communicate directly with the IVC via the renal veins. So the renal veins, the left renal vein and the right renal vein, both will drain into the IVC. The left gonadal vein will actually enter into the left renal vein, while the right gonadal vein will enter directly into the IVC itself, right here, as you can see right here. What's important to note is the left gonadal vein will actually drain into the, into the renal vein at a 90 degree angle. So this being what it is, this is a very much, much more difficult path of blood flow. So this can actually be a site of impedance, causing some sort of thrombosis, or venous stasis in the gonadal vessel, which can then predispose you to varicoceles, which is almost like a dilation of the veins within the testicle itself. Hallmark presentation is a bag of worms. So now we're gonna go ahead and discuss the clinical pearls in this unit. So the first one is the celiac compression syndrome. There's an important structure right here, fiber structure, that is called the median arcuate ligament that we'll discuss in later units. The median arcuate ligament is a fascial sling or a fascial component that wraps around the diaphragm as the abdominal aorta enters into the abdominal cavity. And it's this point right here, if this fascial sling is too low, it can actually end up compressing the celiac trunk. And these symptoms can be variable, however it can be asymptomatic, and but it can also include things like diffuse abdominal pain, postprandial pain after you consume food, or even nausea and vomiting. The next one we're going to discuss is a really important one that's often tested is SMA compression syndrome. So what happens is this is, as we remember, the SMA is lo located both anterior to and inferior to the duodenum. So what happens is, if this is your SMA, and this is your artery, your abdominal aorta, and this is your duodenum, what happens is there's fat located right here, right here, and this is all pretty much fat. And this, all this fat right here helps cushion and separate the SMA from the duodenum, from the posterior portion of the abdominal aorta. What happens when in elderly people or anorexic or bulimic patients where this fat pad is decreased, or even if the artery itself is much more sharply arising, you can actually completely compress 
you can compress this duodenum to a point where the food can't pass through. So all this fat's pretty much gone at this point. And if that happens, then you get things such as, again, postprandial pain after eating. You can get nausea and vomiting and abdominal discomfort. And it's usually this one that's very much tested. The next one that we're going to discuss, again, is this portal venous congestion, this portal hypertension, as it's called. So what happens, again, when these pathologic situations may arise, whether it's from anything that pretty much causes increased clotting or increased thickening of the blood, or just increased pressure itself, whether it's cirrhosis because blood can't pass through the liver, hepatic malignancies for, again, blood can't pass through the liver because of the cancer, hepatitis because the liver has been so scarred, autoimmune disorders, which also scar the liver, Bud Chiari syndrome, which is considered to be clotting of the hepatic vessels itself, or vascular hypercoagulable states, such as lupus, factor V Leiden deficiency, all these can contribute to a, a hypercoagulable state. When this occurs, blood will then back up into the portal venous system. When blood backs into the portal venous system, blood will then try to be rerouted through the systemic system. That's what causes these varices. So the, the best mnemonic that I, I often use was gut, butt, and kaput. Gut, meaning that's where you get your esophageal varices, your butt, which is where you get your internal hemorrhoids, and then your caput, which is your caput medusa, like the snake heads around the umbilical vessels itself. And those are what I consider to be very hallmark presentations of portal venous congestion or portal hypertension. Of course, if you're going to have such things like cirrhosis, hepatitis, hepatic malfunction, hepatic deficiency, you're going to get a hallmark of other symptoms occurring. You're going to get a coagulopathy because your liver is where all of your, pretty much all of your coagulation cascade proteins are made. You're going to get jaundice because the conjugation system is not working well because there's liver malfunction or it's just not being able to process because the enzymes are gone. You're going to get testicular atrophy, gynecomastia, and these often happen because when you have liver malfunction or hepatic dysfunction, it will actually cause an increase in estrogen levels. So estrogen levels will cause testicular atrophy, cause gynecomastia, tenderness in the breasts, as well as palmar erythema, which, in which your, your palms actually become very reddened. And that's all because of increased estrogen levels. Ascites is because your liver makes albumin, and because if albumin is not present, there's no proteins pulling the water into the into the blood vessels. So if no water is coming into the blood vessels, all the water can leave. And that's when you get people with these really, really big bellies. And then the last one is where you have asterixis and encephalopathy. Encephalopathy is just because all these waste products that the liver usually takes care of can't really be excreted or eliminated, so that it causes your brain to kind of malfunction. And then asterixis is, again, this is a problem with, with wastes. It can be with liver problems. It can be with jaundice. It can be with uremia. Anything that causes increase in waste. And asterixis is when you ask a patient to make a, a, hand, a stop sign with your hands or stick out your hands, and their hands will actually flap because the wastes in their body are causing their, their the motor system to actually become malfunctioning, and it's causing almost like a, a type of clonus happening with your hands. And the last one is nutcracker syndrome. And this nutcracker syndrome is where you have the left renal vein will actually be compressed between the SMA and the abdominal aorta. So as you can see, you can get the left renal vein can be compressed between the SMA and the abdominal aorta right here. And if this occurs, it's very easy to understand. Again, variable presentation or anything is asymptomatic. You can get blood in the urine, hematuria. You can get engorgement of the left gonadal veins and varicoceles, as we discussed before, or you can get nausea and or vomiting. And that concludes Da Vinci Academy's section on the abdomen, our first lecture on the vasculature of the abdominal cavity.